Our next speaker I've known for almost 47 years, and uh, he, he's got what I think is uh, a really neat job. Mark is a uh, third generation Air Force Colonel following in his grandfather and his father and now his footsteps. And we're really proud of that. So now he's the commander of the 45th Operations Group down at Patrick Air Force Air, Air Space Force Station. And you've been able to read his bio. So without further ado, I'll do a Rodney introduction and do things short. <laughs> So over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dad. Uh, you know, it's really cool to be able to do this. Dad and I have been talking about doing this for a while. And and every time he asked, I kept saying, well, you know, this this whole Space Force thing is happening and things are moving all over the place. And I met, you know, let me wait till things settle down. And and uh, I think we're gonna be in a in a in a uh, kind of constantly evolving state for a while. And so now is the right time. And uh, I look forward to, to talking to you about what the what the 45th Space Wing does is uh, within the Space Force, um, and then I'll kind of dive a little bit more deeply into specifically what the the folks that uh, that I get to lead within the operations group do, because um, that's pretty much the the forward facing um, uh, you know visual that you see when when rockets go off the ground from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. All right. So like I said, uh, uh, here at the 45th Space Wing, and we call ourselves the world's premier gateway to space. Um, and I think we, we dem we've we demonstrated that going back into the into the uh, you know the late late 50s uh, uh, from the, the first launches here um, from from the Space Coast. Um, I'm going to advance these slides, and I think the the robust Air Force network I'm operating on. We'll eventually go through. Okay, so you should see five pictures of uh, either four, really it's four launches and, and one, one Falcon 9 from the uh, National Reconnaissance Office launch 108 coming back to land. Um, this is just a, a nice representation of, of, uh, of a handful of the launches that we've done over the last, uh, let's see, uh, NROL 108 was in December. So it's really five of the last, uh, I think, seven launches we've done. Our sixth one this calendar year was actually yesterday morning at uh, around 3:20 a.m., 3:24 a.m. to be to be precise. And then our next one is uh, we're we're prepping to do that early next week, which will be another another SpaceX launch. Um, but over the last, uh, let me grab my 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 notes here on on launches because we uh we have kind of an ever-changing nearly every day changing set of how many launch uh, launches we're prepping for and how many launch requests we get but just to give you a, a kind of a snapshot over the last 12 months we've launched 36 times um and uh the previous year we did uh 18 launches so you know think about uh What's been going on over the last over the last year uh, around the world, and the, we we've doubled our operations tempo uh, during that uh, during that period. And I'll go into a little bit more of that uh, later on because there's there's a lot of behind the scenes work that uh, I think we are we are now just starting to do a better a, a more deliberate job of of uh, of communicating the hours and hours of work and the the, the broad community of of uh, organizations that we have to to uh, to coordinate with in order to say yes to get to get a launch off the ground <clears throat> excuse me i would be remiss if i didn't uh, talk about this next topic in 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 uh, some level of, of depth um you know, we have for right on about a year now been been operating uh, a, uh, a space, well, now a Space Force base and a Space Force uh, station uh, in the midst of the pandemic. And I think, you know, er everybody's been doing it. Um, but but again, to kind of foot stomp what I said a couple of minutes ago, that, that we've done it uh, while we doubled our operations tempo. Um, and what we done, we also have done it while we returned astronaut, you know, astronaut launches uh, back to the United States after a, a nine-year gap since we flew out the space shuttle in 2011. And we've done it with um, flying 
uh, a number of, uh, of SpaceX Falcon 9 launches, a United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy, which is a, uh, we don't do those very often. And so it takes a lot of work and a lot of coordination to, to make sure those happen. Uh, so it's really been uh, quite a banner year, uh, banner 12 months for us. Um, we have a fantastic medical group down here that has really uh, kept us uh, very safe and very healthy uh, as, a, as, a, as a base installation community, including our, uh, our military members, our civilians, our contractors, and our families. We've been very fortunate. Um, uh, but uh, you know, their ability to, to, to track and to do the contact tracing and communicate has been absolutely pivotal to our ability to to, to execute the mission and and operate the the installation, um, and you know we are just like the rest of the the rest of the country, as as aggressively as possible putting putting shots in arms uh, and vaccinating our uh, our our uh, critical team members here at uh, on the space coast. Uh, just a quick history of some um, some major events you know over the last. I guess we're coming up on on uh, you know, 70, 70 plus years now of, of the installation here and the heritage of the of the wing um, goes back to being so I, a lot of the, the the Navy folks out there. So this this goes back to us being a, a, a part of a naval air station. It was Banana River Naval Air Station uh, through uh, through World War Two. And then uh, as with all things, the Air Force came in and, and, and took it over and did a better job. And uh, and turned it into the space wing and now the space force which i hope to to join here and in, in hopefully in a couple months uh, owns it and we you know we're the the first space force base and space force station um uh, in the department of defense uh, but the history has been going back and, and and really um a lot of the the testing of ballistic missiles and the testing of rockets and getting our first uh, uh capability to put satellites in orbit the, anything when when it comes to to uh, to large rockets and and either going to space or uh, ensuring we have the capability to to uh, launch intercontinentally um, has uh, has ties back here going back to a lot of the work that General Schriever and uh, and others did back in the in the 50s um, and you know we talk about shuttle so I was assigned here during the the end of the shuttle uh, shuttle era. Uh, that had a pretty significant impact on the community, and and then coming back a couple different assignments since uh, 2011, um, the the Space Coast is 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 alive and um, a lot of industrial activity going on here with with I've talked about SpaceX and United Launch Alliance and and Blue Origin and and uh, and and a whole a whole host of uh, industry partners that are really revitalizing what's going on here. Uh, it's it's a really exciting time to be here. Okay, quickly, I'll do the obligatory organization chart to show you who our leadership team is. Uh, General Stephen Purdy is the the wing commander here. He got here the first week of January of this year, and then our command chief uh, Scott King, and our vice commander Brandy Walton, uh, the two other group commanders, my my uh, my my uh, uh, peers. Uh, leading uh, here on the, in the 45th Space Wing, Colonel Tracy Bozung doing the medical group work, and then Colonel Ed Marshall uh, running the mission support group, um, and then and then the operations group. And so let me go into just a just a couple of minutes on the operations group. So like I said, we're kind of the forward facing one, the one that you the work that you see if you're watching the news and and a launch happens. Um, I, I have I have four squadrons and a detachment that that work for me. And then um, also a, uh, a a group of project managers that are driving innovation activities so that we can get after uh, automation and and technological advances that can help us streamline our processes and and uh, and, and and meet the the uh, the operations tempo that we're that we're facing because like I said, 36 launches in the last 12 months compared to 18 before, and we're we're really looking at. At hitting hitting 50 plus year over year going forward, um, but in my uh, in my group I've got a, a, a launch squadron that uh, makes sure that the um, that the rockets that support national security space missions so think GPS and satellite communications and 
and uh, um, uh, Intel surveillance reconnaissance missions that the rockets are ready to go. Um, we 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 kind of self-insure from the government perspective. We we don't uh, we don't go get an insurance policy in case something bad happens. We make sure that when we when we uh, connect all the pieces and parts together and run the test that we've got it ready to go and drive to 100% success from a launch perspective for the rocket and then also for the satellites we put on top. I have a range squadron that uh, basically runs uh, a, think of a, a large test range that has radars and telemetry equipment. We have, we have probably the most instrumented meteorological capability in the Department of Defense here on the Eastern Range for lightning detection, uh, support and winds and uh, all of the various types of meteorological data that anybody would ever want to know in order to make sure that we're not launching into an unsafe environment. Uh, I have a, 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 a squadron that's focused on uh, communication systems and cyber protection, cyber defense. Um, and then uh, the, the weather squadron that that takes the data from the range equipment and, and makes the assessments on whether we can or can't launch. And then also there's a detachment that works for me right now that uh, that does human space flight personnel recovery planning. And so the last year when we had Bob and Doug go up in uh, the first part of June and then the next crew that launched in November and, and then Bob and Doug returning in uh, at the end of uh, July, um, we make sure that we have a Department of Defense personnel recovery posture around the globe in order to make sure that if something bad goes wrong, we can go get those national treasures of astronauts out safely and bring them back to uh, bring them back to, to the uh, to United States. So that, that's a little bit of depth on, on what we do in the operations group. Uh, real quickly, we have some pretty large mission partners. Um, the, we have a Naval Ordnance Test Unit that we work with very closely for sea launch ballistic missile tests. Uh, the, there's a, a rescue, a reserve rescue wing here that we support pretty significantly for our airfield work. And, and then uh, the uh, commander, uh, the, we have the Air Force Technical Application Center, uh, Defense Equal Opportunity Management Institute. And then on the right, uh, Mr. Bob Cabana is the director of Kennedy Space Center. We have a very significant uh, partnership, collaborative relationship with them. Uh, they're right on the other side of the Banana River from us, so we're we're on the Cape on the ocean side, and they're right across the river. We share a lot of uh, of, uh, of support resources and, uh, and and mission activities together. This is our mission and vision. We are focused on 100% mission success, driving to shape the future, innovative activities, innovative processes, and then always taking care of our people. And uh, speaking of people. Just a snapshot on, on what we have here at, on the team. Uh, within the wing, we have uh, a little over 5,000 people, about 900 military, a little over 1,400 civilians, just a few more of the uh, um, you know, 1,500 uh, contractors, and then about 1,500 dependents that are connected with the wing. And then when you add in all the mission partners, that goes up to over 15,000 people that we're supporting. A historic 2020. Starting on the left, uh, like I said, 36 launches in the last 12 months. Uh, what, what's key, uh, uh, another key thing that we do uh, as an installation is, uh, is uh, you know, as, as you as a, as a civil, uh, civic organization you know, and, and service organization, you know, we, we have a relationship with the community. We built a, uh, what we call Starbase. It's a STEM program where the fifth graders from the region, um, most of them are are maybe a little disadvantaged in in uh, what resources they might have at home. Um, we we uh, bring them in for a program. Unfortunately, COVID hit just after we started that, but they've been doing some virtual work. But it's got 3D printers and and uh, interactive uh, STEM rooms, um, really trying to um, to uh, connect and, and and connect the military and connect with uh, with uh, you know injecting STEM early on in in uh, in education. I talked about space flight. Uh, you see Bob and Doug there in the top right. And then uh, I talked about our weather team on the bottom left and appropriate for for this month with Women's History Month and, and, and the, the, the key role that women play. I heard the, the talk uh, earlier about the value uh, to the economy. Uh, that is a representation. So that was our first all weather or all female launch weather team. 
So we have roughly five or six uh, people that are part of the weather team. So the, 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 the folks that are looking at all the data, this was the first launch weather team and that was last year. Um, and then of course, down in the bottom in the center, uh, Vice President Pence came in December and renamed uh, Cape Canaveral and Patrick Space Force Base. So that was a pretty, pretty big event. All that during the pandemic. Okay, quickly, Cape Canaveral, this is what we look like right now. We have uh, United Launch Alliance launches off of uh, what we call Complex 41 and Complex 37. Complex 41 is the Atlas V and Complex 37 is the Delta IV Heavy. And there are uh, two more of those missions left for us over the next uh, two and a half years. Then uh, SpaceX is at Complex 39A, which is up on NASA's property, and then uh, also at Complex 40. So they have two launch pads that allows them to, uh, to do a pretty quick pace of Falcon 9, la Falcon 9 launches. And then moving down, there's a uh, landing zone uh, that's principally used by SpaceX right now. So they'll periodically, instead of landing on a barge, they'll bring the, the the, uh, the booster back to land. And uh, that is an amazing sight to see a, a, a rocket that left come right back and land nice and nice and cleanly and perfectly, uh, not too far from where you are. And then you feel this, you feel and hear the sonic boom, uh, not uh, roughly around the time when it lands. It's a pretty spectacular experience. And then uh, going down, um, there's uh, j there's a, a complex 46, and then just north of that actually is a is a complex 36 where Blue Origin is building out their new Glenn capability, and you'll see that represented on the next slide. This is what we look what we're looking to see over the next three to three to four years or so. Uh, lots of smaller rocket companies are are coming in, and uh, we're going to probably double the number of launch customers that we have uh, here in the next couple of years, uh, which is really an exciting time. And we'll see, we'll, you know, hopefully everyone's successful um, because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, there's a, a pretty significant demand to, to put, to, to put satellites on orbit. Okay. And then I'm going to spend the rest of my time going to build this out. That's it. I'm spend the rest of my time talking here. Um, when, when we talk the Eastern Range, which is really the operational area and capability that we present uh, from the 45th Space Wing to the Space Force, and then and really to the nation, um, we we talk about this really highly inclined orbit region, all the way down to the to the polar orbit uh, aspect, which. We've, we've actually done two polar launches in the last six months, which is two more than we had done in the previous 50 years combined. Um, it's pretty exciting to, uh, to see a rocket launch up and over the top of you and then go south. It's uh, uh, not, not, what we're, not what we've been used to. But this is the Eastern Range. And, and, and we make sure that in this entire area, all the way till the point where the rocket cannot cause harm to the to the public anymore. That we know exactly where it is, and uh, and we have either the positive control of being able to uh, to to make sure that it doesn't go off track through uh, command destruct. So if it's going off track and and uh, it's gonna it's gonna cause harm, we have a group of people that are they're trained and qualified to uh, to to destroy the vehicle. So that's called. Uh, uh, traditional flight termination command destruct capability and or there's also a, autonomous flight uh, termination systems where the, the the rocket itself is providing its own awareness of where it is its own gps uh, you know, guided information and uh, will 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 destroy itself if it's going off course but all of that um, preparation is weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and months sometimes to make sure that we know exactly where it's going, we have all the uh, all the data we need in order to uh, make sure that the public's safe and that the mission's successful. Um, and and so up here at uh, Cape Canaveral and, and Patrick Air Force Base, as I, I kind of mentioned earlier, we have a number of radars, large telemetry antennas, some optic systems, um, uh, just a, a, a wealth of, of uh, weather sensor data. Um, and, and then all the comm and data processing that we need to, to connect all that together. 
and then that is information that we we make available to ourselves for the for the military purpose of, uh, of operating the range and, and keeping the public safe and then also make it available to the to the launch provider again whether it's united launch alliance or, or spacex um, so we'll support launches that that kind of hug and go up the coast um, we'll support launches that that effectively fly off uh, due east and then all the way down to the to the polar orbit you see the uh, the SLBM, the Sea Launch Ballistic Missile Corridor. So that's where we support the the Naval Ordnance Test Unit with uh, with uh, test launches to make sure that our uh, our submarine nuclear capability, nuclear deterrent capability, is 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 uh, vital or is vibrant and 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 uh, and ready to go to take care of its deterrent mission. Um, the uh, also, you see down in the bottom right, we have a, a we have Ascension Island. Uh, that is a, uh, uh, a we have a um, a small area there, airfield and some equipment, and we share uh, share some of that uh, uh, area with the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, we have capability down there uh, to to support uh, depending upon where the where the launches are going. Um, the one thing I really want to kind of emphasize here is that. To get a launch off the ground, uh, it is not uh, it is not just something that we control ourselves. We don't get to make all the decisions in the wing. We're dependent upon the FAA. We're dependent upon other DoD agencies to make sure that we have um, we have uh, airspace clearance because we we won't fly rockets over ships and airplanes um, because we we tre you know we protect and treasure. The, the public. And so we make sure to the likelihood of less than one in a million that we're not going to cause harm to uh, to public. So we, we end up spending hours and hours and hours to make sure that uh, the uh, airspace is clear all the way up the, the East Coast. Uh, typically, our launches are kind of, you know, at, at the uh, the one thirty to two o'clock range, if you're if you're looking at us from a clock perspective. Um, and uh, um, it, that that's really the this public safety mission. We put we put uh, tons and tons of uh, time and treasure into that. Um, I th I think I think now I'll I'll just I'll hit one more slide and then I'll pause and, and see if there are any questions. I think we have a few few minutes for those. I don't want to to go too much longer. Um, so I talked earlier about the launch forecasts and and the when we. Did the snapshot on this slide? It was 52 uh, missions this year. I think we'll be maybe a little bit less than that, but we are tracking. So we've done six in in the first two months, and we have 42 planned for the rest of uh, of this calendar year. But uh, uh, just as an example, so 36 launches in the last 12 months, but we had 300 launch requests to get those 36, and we entered the launch count 58 times to get 30 to 36. Uh, there's a lot of uh, variables that drive uh, weather, drive reschedules. Whether it's weather, um, the launch vehicle is not ready, the satellite's not ready, uh, conflicts with the airspace coordination, as I was talking about before. Uh, but 300 times in the last 12 months, we had a launch customer say, "Hey, I'd like to launch on a day." Those 300 turned into 36 launches. Um, but again, the key. And I, I, I talk about it all the time. The key is is collaboration and this interdependent culture that we have and we're trying to develop even further between Space Force and FAA, Navy, other DOD agencies, NASA, SpaceX, ULA, Blue Origin, Space Florida, which is a, a Florida uh, government uh, entity that that's driving uh, economic uh, activity for in the space space area down here uh, and the, Can Port Can the, the Cape Canaveral Port Authority. You know, all these disparate offices that all have to work together in order to get to T zero, and it's uh, it it can't just be you know cooperate and graduate. We we really have to collaborate uh, in order to get to yes. So um, with that.